Hey guys, welcome back to another segment of Bible Unplugged. I'm Wave Nunley, and we really appreciate you joining us yet again for another deep dive into Scripture. In light of the time of year, we're wanting to look today at the resurrection of Jesus. And we're wanting to look at evidence for Easter. The, um, the uh, resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our faith, and we want it grounded on a firm foundation. So let's take a look at what Paul has to say just to start off our study together today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says he's telling them about the gospel that he had preached to them, by which they are saved. This is the message of how to be right with God. And he says, and I delivered to you as a first or primary or basic or foundational importance what I also received. Now let's take a look at what it is that is of most basic or most foundational importance in terms of the message that Paul delivered to the church at Corinth. That is, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. You don't get that right, you're, you never get off of square one. We have to have the sin problem dealt with for restoration of relationship with God to take place. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is what we refer to as the passion of the Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now Paul then goes into another list and he says, So what if Jesus was not raised from the dead? If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. There's number one. Number two, your faith is also in vain. Number three, we are found to be false witnesses because we've said that God raised Jesus from the dead when in fact if He wasn't raised, then we're not telling the truth. Here it is again, and your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. And those who have died in Christ have perished. They have no hope of their own resurrection because there has been no prototype of the resurrection taking place, the re resurrection of Jesus. But in fact, Paul says in verse 20, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep, meaning he's the forerunner, a precursor of yet a greater uh, resurrection in the future. What Paul has said here the way that he has directed our attention to this most foundational aspect of the Christian faith, and he has grounded it and rooted it in a historical event, sort of kind of assumes a bigger issue which is on the table, and that is, what is the nature of biblical faith? Some would suggest that it is more speculative. Some that it's almost like hope against hope. Well, I hope that I've chosen the right way. I hope I believe uh, the right way. Um, others, it's more of a subject, subjective kind of um, feeling that, that you have. I think, I hope, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm right with God. But what is the nature of real biblical faith? You hear faith talked about all, all the time. Uh, when you are um, watching Christian TV, when you're reading Christian literature, but what does the Bible have to say about the nature of faith? We're going to go back to a passage that we've only recently dealt with in a previous segment, and that is Exodus chapter 3. God said to Moses, I am who I am is sending you back to deliver the people of Israel. By the way, because of the time of year, Passover, this is still a very relevant pa passage to discuss. And, and God said to him, tell him I am is sending you. I am has sent me to you. Y the Lord, again, all capital letters, means that in, behind this English text lies the Hebrew yod heh vav -Hey, or Y-H-V-H, or Yahweh. Um, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In other words, if you want to know, people of Israel, who's sending me and who it is that you're supposed to trust for your deliverance and for your protection, for your um, guidance and provision in the wilderness, then know that this I am, this Yahweh, is the God who was kept covenant 
with your fathers, was always faithful to them, to the promises that he made to them. So not subjective at all, but an appeal, as Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15, to historical reality, events in history in which God invaded time and space, met people right where they were, and then dealt with their issues, their problems, their needs um, uh, in, in a very effective ways. All the way to the end of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, we hear about this same kind of the God of reality, the God of history, the God who invades time and space, the God who can be proven. So in the book of Malachi, last book in our English Bibles, in the Hebrew Bible, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the prophet says, so that there may be food in my house and test me. Uh, the Hebrew is um, Yivchanuni, and uh, here you have... Um, uh, the uh, conjunction and, then you have the root of the word, the ooh there means y'all do this, and the knee on the end means me. And y'all test me. Test me. This word bachan or um, uh, bachina in Hebrew today is the word for where a teacher gives a test to a student to see if that student actually knows the material that the student is supposed to know. This is, try me, prove me, put me to the test, and see if I'm not going to come through for you. God invites this of us through the prophet Malachi's words. Put me to the test. Now let's jump to New Testament realities, and in the Gospel of John we have Jesus saying, if I don't do the works of my Father, then you don't have to believe what I say. But if I do them, even though at this point you're not believing, then believe the works so that you might know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. In other words, you can know that what I'm telling you is the truth by watching my life, the product, the fruit of that life, and you can know that my words are true based on what you see with your own eyes, what you see me doing. And so, yet again, in the New Testament, we're seeing that it's not just a subjective experience. It's not just some kind of a speculation, a hope, a myth, or a legend. It is, watch what I do. Watch, what, uh, watch the result of my life. Watch the fruit of my works, and then you will know whether to believe what, my, what I'm telling you or not. In the book of Acts, we get the same kind of approach to faith, and that is to, to these apostles and followers of, of his, Jesus presented himself alive. This is a great segue back into our study on the resurrection of Jesus because it's actually talking about that resurrection of Jesus. He presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. It's a very good translation of the original language there. Convincing, and look at that word, proofs. So in the Bible, whether you're talking about Hebrew Bible or whether you're talking about uh, New Testament, whether you're talking about the teachings of Moses or you're talking about the teachings of Jesus, makes no, no difference. The approach to faith is exactly the same. It's not pie in the sky by and by. It's not hoping against hope. It's not some sort of philosophically based speculation. Rather, it is trusting in a God of history who has demonstrated his trustworthiness, his being worthy of our trust, his faithfulness, and now he's calling on us to trust him yet again based on past track record. So if the early church had these, as Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says, many convincing proofs, well, do we have any of those today? We certainly don't have on a regular basis Jesus appearing in his post-resurrection body to us on a regular basis, but do we have any of these similarly convincing proofs that uh, the early church had, that that first century of Jesus followers did? And yeah, actually, I think that we do. So let's look at a series of these. First of all, we get the reaction of those who first saw him. And this is important. 
most of you have watched TV shows, have, have watched like detective or police shows where uh, when first presented with so-and-so has died or somebody got poisoned or whatever, the first reaction, that, that visceral reaction of an individual tells a lot to that detective, that interviewer in a police precinct um, as to how much maybe does that person know anything relevant to this case? Was that person possibly involved? They look for that first immediate gut reaction. And indeed, all of Jesus' followers demonstrate things like surprise, confusion, fear, and even disbelief recorded in the Bible itself regarding Jesus' resurrection. Now, what happens in Bible Unplugged when, you, when I put up a slide and there's a bunch of Bible references there? Well, first of all, we're not giving you our own personal spin or opinion. We're trying to give you a straight, pure Word of God. Secondly, we're wanting you to take the opportunity to do a little bit of homework on your own. And so we throw some uh, scriptures up there in parentheses to give you a chance to do homework on your own and come to your own conclusions. Just sort of a kickstart to your own personalized study. So during the week, you can go back to YouTube. You can re-watch these videos. You can look at the uh, passages that we put there. And you can use that to start your own uh, study. Um, so uh, these guys that, uh, that Jesus appears to are, are not spending their time huddled together, uh, kibitzing in the corner, uh, and, and trying to cook up some sort of far-fetched story or get their stories straight. This is not conspiracy. Rather, their re reaction, their historical situation is that they're in hiding. They're in incredible grief over the loss of their master, and they're actually surprised when he returns from the dead. Doesn't look like conspiracy. Uh, doesn't look like a group of people trying to get their story straight so they don't end up getting caught in a lie. These people are actually surprised at the return of Jesus from the dead. Early written records. All four of our biblical gospels insist that Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected, came back to life on the third day. And I've given you a bunch of references here. Again, homework time, right? Uh, so we've got the, the we've got the testimony, first of all, of people's immediate gut reaction. Now we have written records that are uh, standing behind, uh, serving as a support for or as a testimony to and they all tell the same story, and they're all talking about the third day Jesus comes back uh, to life. So written records from the first century A.D. when Jesus uh, lived, ministered, and died. And about this business of that eyewitness testimony reflected in these passion narratives, we call them, uh, the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, uh, specialist Richard Balcom, a uh, British New Testament scholar, uh, recently reminded us that the um, material in our Gospels rests on eyewitness testimony. And this is important even today when we're trying to establish fact in our courts of law, trying to establish uh, reality. What actually happened, what was done, what was said, etc. What was a sequence of events? And eyewitness testimony is basically uh, the end all. It's the golden standard for establishing truth and reality as regards um, a sequence of events, real history. Similarly, the rest of the New Testament bears witness to these exact same realities, death, burial, resurrection on the third day, and with the same degree of emphasis. This stuff is constantly emphasized throughout the rest of Scripture in terms of um, how often it comes up and the details that are reported. The um, earliest verbal expressions of um, this come to us from the book of Acts, where we are hearing uh, people who are apostles and people who are not apostles, folks like Stephen and Philip. And they are preaching publicly about this Jesus event. And inevitably, they talk about the death, burial, and resurrection on the third day of their 
uh, master, and I've given you pretty much all of the relevant references there. Again, wonderful time for doing a little bit of homework, personal study on your own uh, in the course of the week. Josephus, first century Jewish historian, first century Jewish historian who wrote about the same time that the New Testament was being written, and he also gives testimony to these realities. He said, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, condemned him, Jesus, to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples didn't abandon their discipleship to him. In the underlined portion, they reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah about whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Non-Christian, non-author of the New Testament, and he's basically bringing the same thing. He's not exactly saying that he's, he agrees with what the early disciples of Jesus were preaching, but he's saying this was the content of their preaching. And guess what? What he says was the content of their preaching, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, corresponds perfectly to what we have in the gospel record and what we also have in terms of these reports of these oral presentations of the um, Jesus event in the book of Acts by both apostolic and non-apostolic people who uh, show up in the narrative in the book of Acts. In the Babylonian Talmud, which is a uh, one big collection of literature from the early rabbis, in the course of, this is the purpose of the footnote, in the course of a lengthy discussion about Jesus, uh, about events uh, connected to his life, and about how he, according to them, led Israel astray, uh, they say, they make this kind of enigmatic kind of statement. It's almost a standalone, and yet it's in this context of talking about Jesus. Woe to him who makes himself alive by means of the name of God. It's, an, in a sense, an accusation that Jesus has used inappropriately some kind of a magical formula that included that divine name, that super holy name, uh, with the four letters yod Hey vav Hey or Y-H-V-H, Yahweh, um, in order to resuscitate himself. It's an interesting kind of a backhanded way of saying, yeah, that actually happened. It didn't happen the right way. It was inappropriate the way that, uh, that uh, it was accomplished. But yeah, we've, in, in, in our oral tradition, we have gotten reports that, uh, that Jesus came back from the dead. How about another thing? Multiple attestation, or we could also call this the way you hear about it on uh, TV shows about lawyers and courtrooms and um, police uh, activities and that sort of thing, uh, call this corroboration. Witnesses corroborating the testimony of one another. Independently of each other, one witness will tell a story and another will come along and corroborate or verify or back up or support the witness, uh, the other witness's uh, version of the story. So notice that we've got lots and lots of people in the first century, right at the flashpoint in which this event takes place, and they're from all across the spectrum of um, uh, of, of human experience. We have women at the tomb. So we've got women and men. We've got people who are disciples. They're not apostles, but we've got people who are non-apostles and we've got people who are apostles. Uh, we've got people who wrote material in the New Testament and people who didn't write, young and old. We've got folks all across the spectrum and they're all bearing witness to the same thing. Multiple attestation or corroboration of witness. Women at the tomb, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, we hear about this in Mark and a longer story in Luke. And then we come 
circle back to that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul gives this lengthy discussion of the resurrection of Jesus. And in his discussion, right after he said all the stuff that we covered at the very beginning about this being the, the groundwork, the foundation, the basis of the Christian faith, then Paul proceeds to give the evidence. He gives a list of witnesses people who saw the resurrected Jesus immediately after or not long after his uh, resurrection from the dead. Paul mentions, for example, Peter. And also note that there are people here, in addition to all this plethora of variation of kinds of people, notice also that sometimes Jesus will appear to an individual, sometimes to a small group, and sometimes to a very large group. So Paul gives this list of Peter, then he appeared to the 12. Then he appeared to over 500 people at one time. And by the way, Paul says about them, some of these people have, quote, fallen asleep. And it's a euphemism, first century Greek euphemism for has, have died. But he says, but most of them are still alive. Paul is challenging the reader, challenging the, the, the one who would uh, question, not be willing to step up to the plate and make the commitment um, to, hey, there are people still alive right now. You can go and talk to them personally. We're back to this business of eyewitness testimony. More than 500 people at one time. Then Paul says he appeared to James and then to the 12 again, and then even to Paul himself. And you remember the story in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, told three times in the book of Acts of Paul's um, decision to follow Jesus as one of his disciples on the road to Damascus or the Damascus Road. Um, so big long list of folks that you can uh, pick from in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the references here at the bottom of the screen. Now, about this James that Paul mentions, that Jesus made a special appearance to one individual alone. His name was James. It's never James the son of Je Zebedee or James the brother of John. That, that James is always identified by some sort of a family connection, family relationship. This is a different James. He's not, uh, none of his uh, family connections are given are, uh, at, after his name. And this refers in the New Testament only to one James, and that is James, the half-brother of Jesus. So let's take a look at this unusual case of James, the brother of Jesus. Why would this be function as a, a, a piece of evidence or proof for the resurrection of Jesus, watch the trajectory of James's life. In Mark 3, for the first time we hear about James, unnamed in this text, but included because it says, his own family heard that Jesus was preaching these things, teaching these things, accomplishing these kinds of miraculous acts, and it says they went out to take custody of him they were saying, this is what Jesus' family thought, he has lost his mind. He's gone insane. The Greek reads that he's literally exousies outside of himself. So who would these people be, these, this family? Well, Matthew 13 fills in the blanks there. It says his brothers, James, ah, the firstborn, actually the secondborn, but the firstborn after Jesus, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. By the way, notice all of these are beautiful, perfect Hebrew names. Yaakov, Jacob, Yosef, Joseph, Shimon, Simon, and Yehuda, like Judah Maccabee or Judah the Patriarch. Good, great, great Hebrew names. Mother Mary, Miriam, as in Moses' sister. And all of his sisters. So if uh, if we've got all of his sisters there, then we've got a family, add them all up, of at least 10 people. Jesus comes from a large family, uh, pretty typical of the day. In the book of Galatians, we continue our study of or our uh, tracking with the trajectory of this James's life. In the book of Galatians, he's described along with Cephas or Peter and John as being among the pillars of the first the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. He is in the leadership. How did that happen? Hmm. 
He goes from thinking Jesus is crazy to being among the leadership. Then in Acts 15, we see James functioning. Listen to me, he says, when the whole church is gathered together. And it is my judgment. In other words, James has become not one of, but he has become the leader of the Jerusalem church after Jesus' ascension into heaven. Not only that, but James even contributes a book to the New Testament. The book of James is one of our 27 New Testament books. And then we get our old friend Josephus again. Who is he? First century Jewish person, grew up in the land of Israel, um, uh, was born a priest, became a a follower of the Pharisaic way of life, um, and is an author in the first century writing at the same time the New Testament is being written and in the same language, that language that is called Koine Greek. And so what does Josephus say about this guy uh, whose name is James? He knows of him. And Annas the high priest convened the judges of the Sanhedrin, brought before them a man whose name was James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. There is no other James in antiquity that would be described in this kind of way. He's the brother of Jesus Christ. And certain others, he accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. That's the end of Josephus' account of the death of James. But the first, or the early second century Christian uh, author, historian, whose name was Hegesippus, goes further, fills in more of the blanks. He he said that the leaders told him to take his stand on the temple parapet or pinnacle of the temple and so that you can be easily seen and so that you can be heard by all the people. And they said, O righteous one, because this James had a nickname. He was called in Hebrew, Hatzadik, the righteous one. So Yaakov Hatzadik translates for us into James the righteous whose word we are all obliged to accept because people respect you, they're going astray after this Jesus who was crucified. So tell us what is meant by the door of Jesus. They're asking him to denounce Jesus as being one who led the people astray and to uh, basically denounce any belief that Jesus is the way to the Father, the door. Jesus says, I am the door of the sheepfold. Any who come uh, in a, in a other, by a way other than me, they're, she, they're thieves and robbers, we're hearing in the Gospel of John. So he replied, why are you questioning me about that Son of Man? See, Jesus has been glorified at this point. He's coming with great power, like we hear in Daniel chapter 7. And so they went up and threw down the righteous one, Hatzadik, James the righteous. Um, And they said, let us stone James the righteous. And such was his martyrdom. This James, in his lifetime, has moved from a position of thinking that Jesus has gone crazy. Jesus has lost his mind to the position of being a leader, then the leader of the early church, an author of the New Testament, and now a martyr refusing to uh, denounce Jesus in public, even on pain of death. Such was his martyrdom. Now, a couple of other very quick pieces of evidence. Is this business of Jesus rising from the dead, third day, etc. Is that just all sort of a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy? Is this sort of a made-up story after the fact to kind of um, uh, try to uh, clean up the Jesus story, put a positive spin on it at the very end? But the reality of it is, is that popular messianic expression in the first century in a Jewish land of Israel did not include the rising from the dead of a messianic um, figure. And so there's nothing to have to make up or try to get Jesus to fulfill because it was expected. There was no expectation. Again, remember all of this stuff, third day resurrection, it took everybody by surprise. They were amazed that Jesus, his own followers, that Jesus had come back from the dead. 
Is this a story that was manufactured simply as a means of marketing this um, Jesus story? And the answer to that is no, it, it, that wouldn't work either. Because what we find, and you find it uh, attested in the books of 1 Corinthians and the book of Galatians, is that to the Jews, this business of a crucified, then resurrected Messiah is a stumbling block. It's something, it's a barrier. It prevents people from coming to faith, not encourages them. And then to Gentiles, it is folly. It makes no sense. Uh, they have no place for that in their, um, uh, their cosmology or their uh, belief system. So it's a culture clash. And if these guys were trying to craft a narrative that would be easily accepted, it certainly would not have been this message that they would have crafted. Now, the location of Jesus' burial and also his, his death, burial, and resurrection um, is... Uh, an interesting study in and of itself. So we're back in the land of Israel. We're looking um, at Jerusalem from the air. Here's your compass point, the, the Temple Mount, and the wall that goes around the old city of Jerusalem. And d down at the, at the bottom of the picture, in this area here, is an area that uh, Protestants refer to as the Garden Tomb. Over here, uh, more popular with uh, Orthodox and Catholic believers, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, if you continue on eastward, you get to the Temple Mount, and then the Kidron Valley, and then the Mount of Olives that runs north-south on the east side of Jerusalem. Then, again in layer cake fashion, you get the wilderness of Judah, the Judean wilderness, and you can even see a narrow blue strip at the top of the screen here that is the Dead Sea. So this is sort of the setup. Um, so Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the historic location of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Here's a close-up of that, those two domes. This one has, uh, is the rotunda uh, under which the uh, tomb of Jesus actually rests. Here's an inside picture. Uh, you can see the cenotaph or eticule, great um, layout in the uh, December 2016 um, of a National Geographic on the restoration of the church um, and many of the uh, scientific discoveries that were made in the process of that um, restoration, uh, renovation. For Protestants, again, that down at the bottom of the previous screen, uh, where we were looking at the location for the garden tomb. Here's a close-up of that. Problem with this being is that this is not a tomb in which no man had been laid. This is an Iron Age, a late Iron Age tomb, probably 7th century B.C., based on the style, the, the floor plan, as well as the material culture, uh, pottery and that kind of thing, brought out of this, um, uh, out of this burial area uh, in the 1970s. So this area has um, got the wonderful ambiance, great um, uh, context. Uh, it is a garden. Uh, you can have secluded prayer, uh, observe communion and that sort of thing. But according to all of the historical and archaeological evidence, more than likely the proper location, the correct location, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, Eastern or Greek Orthodox call it the Church of the Resurrection. I, it's sort of a joke, a uh, running joke at least for me. When I teach groups in Israel, um, I let people know that, you know, you can have on this your cake and eat it too. Simply in your mind's eye, click and drag the ambiance, the context of the garden tomb and place that over onto the Church of the Holy Sepulchre slash resurrection and you've got a twofer. And by the way, yes, both tombs are empty. Um, I wrote an article on this about three years ago uh, entitled The Resurrection of Jesus Fact or Fiction. You can find it at this web address. Again, feel free to go back and uh, watch the video over again and you can write that down and type it into your browser. It'll take you directly to that article. Um, there's no cost, no sign up. It's just there for you. Uh, fill in blanks that we didn't cover uh, today. But what I would like to do is I would like to conclude our time together in this study today 
with the final paragraph of that particular article. I, it, it sums it up as well as I can. In this wonderful season of the year, let's just be reminded that our faith is not based on subjective experience. It's not just about that warm, tingly feeling that you get running up and down your spine when you hear the right song or attend the right service. It, it's not about subject, subjective experience merely. It's not about uh, some kind of philosophical speculation. It's not about myth or legend. The foundation of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus, and that foundation rests firmly upon the testimony of eyewitnesses, not just eyewitnesses, but even martyrs who had originally thought that Jesus was crazy and ultimately gave their life in service to Him and in passing to us as well. God bless you this Passover season. God bless you this Easter season with a realization of the reality, the historical reality of a Jesus who came back from the dead and of a God who is a God of history and keeps His promises. God richly bless you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos. If you're benefiting from the content that you're receiving from them, please make sure that you're following us on Facebook and that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you never miss a thing. While you're at it, share our content with your friends and family. Encourage them to follow us as well. Thanks for helping us to reach as many as we can with a powerful message of God's Word in its original context.